Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 229. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu, Malkinu, our Father, our King. Bless you, Lord, for allowing us to come together and to fellowship with one another from across the miles, using your word as our anchor, as our foundation, realizing that without your precious holy spirit to unlock the words it's really just an intellectual endeavor and we don't want it to be just that we want to please you we want to um be equipped to be ambassadors for your kingdom we want to represent you here on earth and so lord for that reason we study with a purpose we seek we 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 follow the ezra example which is to study in order to do in order to teach but ultimately lord we're we're simply talking about um coming together and worshiping uh, you and fellowshipping with one another for the purpose of glorifying your name building up your kingdom being a light uh, being salt and light uh, to those around us uh being um a conviction um in the earth right uh the, the the body of messiah is that uh by the whole power of the holy spirit plays that role of also convicting uh the world of sin so help us lord to live lives that are uh, exemplary and um uh, worthy of the name that we bear and um help us to continue to forgive one another for the shortcomings that we have lord it's that we simply cannot harbor um uh what we call unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and resentment against one another um lord that's just not the example that you left for us and it's clearly not the lifestyle that is uh, beneficial to us so uh, continue to strengthen us protect us raise us up pro- uh, provide for us as a heavenly father does and we'll be careful to give the praise and the glory b'shem yeshua O. Oh. Maine. Thank you for following me through these um, intense YouTube studies, uh, podcasts that you're um, joining us along, uh, joining us, um, uh, coming along with us uh, week after week. Uh, my name is Arvind Lyman Hanavi, and the entire hour and a half long study is given over to two main topics the first topic being eschatology a biblical study of end time events which we're going to embark on here shortly and the second topic if you're able to make the entire study is entitled a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism it's kind of a spin-off of my earlier uh kind of channel series um uh youtube uh playlist series uh entitled um Ex- exploring the shema discussions on the issues of trinity so it's really an apologetics study on trinitarian verses and currently we're working our way through psalm 110 verses one really kind of down to five and so if that grabs your interest then stick around for the entire uh, hour and a half, half long study all right let's jump into the eschatology study as you can see on your screen right now there's a uh um, there's topic one through six that's already kind of grayed out. We already hit all those topics, and we're presently in topic seven, excursus, the Islamic Antichrist per Joel Richardson. And we're entertaining this discussion about the Antichrist man and his beast system that's going to rise up in the last days and uh, represent a final rebellious effort to throw off God and God's Messiah and God's righteous uh, words and God's truth, etc. So it's there are a lot of places in the Bible that uh, describe this time period known as Daniel's 70th week or the last seven years of Daniel's prophecies that are found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Go back and read that on your own. We studied that in topic um, four and five. And also, as we're working our way towards the book of Revelation, you can see on your screen topic um, 15 and 16, we're working our way using the scriptures that are already set in place for us, kind of in the order that the Bible lays them down. So you can see, as you look at the topics, um, we started with the Old Testament prophecies first, topic 4, 5, 6, etc. And then we're working our way towards topic 8, 9, and then ultimately towards 15 and 16. So we're Eventually, we're going to get through all of it, the uh, Yeshua's all of it discourse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
Um, I don't have the topic on here, but I might add it later. We'll, we'll go through Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, but those are, those are eschatological topics as well. So I hope you're enjoying the, the study. Um, I'm certainly getting a lot of lively feedback from the YouTube comments. I don't um, expect everyone to agree with my perspective. Right now, we're talking about the Islamic Antichrist model. I've got a lot of pushback on that, which is healthy. It's healthy. It's good to have um, people who say, no, we can't be... Uh, an Islamic Mahdi or the twelfth Imam. It's not gonna that doesn't make sense. It's clearly somebody out of Europe. It's clearly King Charles or it's somebody from America. It's Trump or you know um, something like that. Uh, so I'm I'm used to that type of uh, interaction. I think it's great because it it means you're thinking, right? If you're just guys are rolling over and accepting everything I say without challenging anything, then I'm I'm thinking are you are you using your thinking brain? Are you just gonna accept anything that some internet guy says on his YouTube channel? Right? Don't do that. So I'm glad that I'm getting some Bereans out there who are um uh cross uh, what do we say today's terminal? We say fact checking uh what i'm saying so I'm, I'm fine with that all right so let's jump into uh where we left off with joel richardson's book the islamic antichrist you can find it on amazon you can find it online at his own website and at other other resources look in the descriptions of these videos i put the links there for some helpful resources through the book of revelation daniel eschatology as well as direct links to joel richardson's book on Amazon or directly from a site for free like I'm using right now or this other resource which is answeringislam.org also has a version of his book uploaded in an HTML version which is the one we're following right now on your screen the one you see and then lastly there's an uh, uh, there are multiple videos about Islam's pl uh, role in the last days and I'll say this and then I'll just jump into the study and one of those videos is done by my good friend and um partner in crime as you could call us uh rabbi eduardo arroyo from beth el gibor messianic congregation in pennsylvania it's kind of like my home away from home uh, synagogue and so he did a video that i have also linked to in the description below giving a little plug for him uh the first kind of 20 minutes of his uh, hour-long show or whatever he's given over to talking about this islamic antichrist uh concept also so, all right, let's jump right into the study, and I'll do my best not to stop and meander as much. I'll just kind of let the study speak for itself, and I'll only interject uh, when I feel it's necessary. We're backing up uh, just into the quote from the book of Ezekiel, was where we left off last week, so we can now then get Joel Richardson's running commentary on this particular passage. So, this is the book of Ezekiel describing the Antichrist using the title Gog, of Magog. Magog is a place and Gog is the name of a ruler, like a title for a ruler like Pharaoh of Egypt, Gog of Magog. I don't think his name is Gog, but uh, his his title is Gog. And he is portrayed in the book of Ezekiel. And then his name or his title of an individual who is a wicked puppet who's utilized by Satan, he shows up again at the book of in the book of Revelation towards the very very end, like in the twenties or like twenty twenty one twenty two. I can't remember. I think it's maybe twenty or something. But um, so Gog is this antichrist figure. He's a he's a puppet ruler for Satan. So you have to kind of keep that in your mind as you're reading through these prophecies. Satan is the ultimate one who's pulling the strings behind. Antichrist, but Antichrist is the visible representation of Satan's leadership here on earth. So we could almost think of Antichrist as Satan incarnate. I don't know if Satan has that power to do what God can do, which is um, manifest himself as a man, um, like God manifests himself as Christ. But if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. Satan gives all of his authority to this man, this evil man. So let's read about him. You, this is a prophecy that Ezekiel speaks of Gog. I mean, we're talking about um, thousands of years before the end time Antichrist man will actually hit the scene. God foretold of some of his uh, activities, and we gain our understanding of the future event by reading the past prophecies. That's the way we interact with our 
a Bible prophecy when in terms of end time events is to read what the Bible says that that's going to happen because God knows the future um, from the beginning. You Gog, which is Ezekiel's name for the Antichrist, Joel says, you will go up and you will come like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Notice the very in your face um not hidden from anyone's perspective but uh, the military aspect of antichrist when he finally hits the scene you'll come up like storm you'll like a cloud covering the land you and all your peoples and your troops these are like military terms that are being borrowed here it's not talking about some peaceful parade it's not a it's not a pride march that ezekiel's describing here or any such thing this is clearly a military campaign that's um, being described. I believe it's a description of the what was uh, what Bible students call the um, Battle of Armageddon uh, uh, that we're going to see it towards the end of the seventh week of Daniel. It's also pictured for us in the Book of Revelation. So Ezekiel continues. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day. Now pause. What day? Remember, I mentioned when you're reading the Old Testament prophecies, a lot of the prophecies that are describing future events as they culminate in the final wicked, rebellious push of humanity to reject God and God's Messiah, Yeshua, and God's truth, which is the gospel and the word of God itself, humanity is going to come to a, a maturation process. Uh, um, my good friend in the, um, in the Skype class right now, he and I were dialoguing about this before the class. Um, the Bible describes a time in Earth's history when at the very end there'll be the I'm almost like the culmination of humanity's history. Um, the time is coming to a close, drawing to a close. We're in the final act where humanity is going to make one last ditch effort to throw off God and his righteous ways and raise their uh, middle finger high in the air against God in a, in a kind of rebellious uh, gesture to say, you know, raising their fist, which is found in the Old Testament, the Bayad Ramah uh, principle that I described to my friend here. And it's going to be led by this man known as Antichrist. And so when God describes this event in the Old Testament, there are terms like on that day or on in that at that time or so it's a it's a specified day when it says on that day or at that time this is the end times it's not just a single 24-hour day so don't get that have that confusion it's a it's a time period that's given over to specified events to which there will never be a repeat of these specific events so it is a it's a, a defined chapter of human history that we're looking at here. And the day is actually shorthand for the day of the Lord or that day of the Lord. So this is a term that's found in multiple places throughout the Tanakh. And uh, it carries over into the Apostolic Scriptures writings. The day of the Lord or the Lord's day, if you want to borrow John's terminology in the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment against wicked humanity and against the antichrist and his beast system so it's a day of judgment primarily but it's initiated according to my understanding of end time prophecy it's initiated by the rapture which is a day of deliverance for the saints deliverance from the wrath of satan so um it's the 70th week but not all of the seventh week i'll, I'll put a little graphic on the screen in post-production for those of you who are watching this youtube video the day of the lord happens according to my understanding the day of the lord happens in uh sometime after the midpoint of the 70th week sometime in that that last uh quarter of the um seven year time period that people like to call the seven year tribulation which i don't but so that's the day god says it will come about on that day so um the day of the lord and then specifically here the day of the battle of armageddon takes place in that same time frame of the day of the lord towards the very end of the day of the lord just before the millennial kingdom is really ushered in it will come about on that day ezekiel says or god says through ezekiel that thoughts will come into your mind speaking of the antichrist and you will devise an evil plan 
watch this carefully, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Where is that? That's in the Middle East. That's Israel. That's Jerusalem, the land of, of unwalled villages. Satan is going to inspire Antichrist to move against Israel in the last days in one final ditch effort to wipe her off the map. Because Satan realizes that if he can get rid of Israel, then he will he, he thinks that this will put a dent in God's plans to establish his righteous kingdom. Satan can read the Bible just like we can, and God has obviously had his favor on Israel, so Satan knows that Israel's favored. So he's going to do everything he can to attack her, to weaken her, to ultimately destroy her, and so he's going to use this wicked human once again. Satan's going to be inspiring him, but ultimately God is going to allow it. God is going to be in control. God is always in control. He never loses control, even if God's allowing Satan to persecute the righteous peoples of the earth persecute god's chosen ones like he is going to allow ultimately god is in control and therefore it's part of god's plan it ultimately amounts to god's purposes so um god says i will go i'm sorry this antichrist uh has been is given this thought i will go against those who are at rest that live securely all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates. And I believe, and Joel's probably going to mention this as well, I believe the reason Israel is in, is in this state of kind of peace and safety is because they've already made this deal with Antichrist earlier on at the beginning of the seventh week, kicking off the seven-year agreement, kicking off the seventh week itself. They've already made this peace agreement with Israel and her neighbors, her hostile Arab neighbors and Palestinian neighbors and, you know, the the, the all, all those who seek to destroy Israel and wipe her off the map. Uh, Antichrist is going to make a way so that there's some form of mutual, non-aggressive, non-aggression pact uh, I don't know how uh, all the details of whatever peace treaty is going to be on the books, but somehow Israel will get to the point where maybe the Iron Dome doesn't seem as necessary from her perspective because it says she's living without walls and having no bars or gates. It's just a description of a, a kind of a posture of, hey, we're at peace now. Let's just kind of let all the international community into Israel and um, boost our economy and, you know, uh, boost tourism. And let's, you know, let everybody come see the brand new uh, shiny temple that we just rebuilt because it will be rebuilt or some something to that effect. Let's let everybody participate in our uh, greatest achievement of, of, you know, final peace in the Middle East. And that'll look that way for the first three and a half years. But what does Antichrist say? He's going to march up against them to what? To capture spoil and to seize plunder and to turn your hand. This is God uh, telling Antichrist what's going to happen in advance. To turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, right? Even the, um, the, the desert that surrounds Israel, right? The Jordan and places in the south. Places where that are, are largely given over to maybe desert area like south of Jerusalem, Dead Sea and areas around there. You know, there's not a lot of development out there, but with peace and safety and with the help of the economy that the Antichrist is going to have access to, you know, his immense uh, global wealth and, and et cetera, et cetera, and the resources pouring into Israel, then we'll be able to develop some of those um, desert areas. So, uh, waste places which are now inhabited, and he'll come against the people, and Joel agrees with me, Israelites, who are gathered from the nations, right? They're returning to Jerusalem, who have acquired cattle and goods. So, it's a description of their economic, um, uh, how could we say, uh, success, as it were, right? So, Israel's going to be thriving at the, from the first part of the week, uh, the first part of the seventh week, everything will be looking good. In fact, the rest of the world will also probably be um, experience uh, unprecedented um, global rest and peace. And this, at the same time, these uh, times will be signaled by some, um, you know, some uh, disturbing wars and rumors of wars. The, you know, the first seal rider comes in on a white horse, and he's carrying a bow but no arrows, and yet. Uh, it's the begin. It's the beginning of the beginning of the of birth pangs that Yeshua describes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's really the beginning of the end, but it's the calm before the storm, right? If the world looks out at the skies and says everything looks fine, 
you know, blue skies, gentle breeze, the birds are singing, you know, the, the crickets are, are chirping, every, every, you know, the flowers are, are doiling, or what, what do they do? They, what does Solomon describe? They spinning or whatever? Um, yeah, everything looks good, but really it's the calm before the storm, because once the midpoint hits, that's when the storm hits, and that's when all hell breaks loose. So uh, Ezekiel finishes by saying all these people who live at the center of the world. He's simply describing the... Um, epicenter of the world's activities uh being there in the middle east with this antichrist figure making sure that um everything's kind of hunky-dory so he can set israel up for the kill right he can set um the middle east up for his worldwide domination and if this is an islamic antichrist well then at the beginning of the seventh week israel's probably not going to be feeling any threat from islam they won't be thinking that there's any kind of threat from this religious leader who is actually Antichrist. And yet, by the midpoint of the week, um, then things are going to change drastically. So that was a quote from Ezekiel 39, 38, verse 9 through 12. Okay, let's read Joel Richardson's commentary from this passage. According to the Bible, Joel says, after this attack, right, what attack is he talking about? He's talking about around the midpoint of the week that antichrist is going to turn his sights on israel for the purpose of making them his headquarters so he's going to have to get rid of the jewish presence there he's going to have to desecrate the temple and we know he's going to right that's the abomination of desolation that daniel prophesied about in his book that yeshua uh, warned us about in matthew mark and luke the all of it discourses and that paul also mentioned where he talks about the man of lawlessness taking his seat in the temple declaring himself to be god and and in opposition to every object of worship or so-called god declaring himself to be god this is the midpoint event of the week this is the abomination of desolation this will be followed very shortly or maybe even uh, after so sometime closely related to this abomination there will be some type of military campaign against jerusalem that many bible uh, teachers describe as the jerusalem campaign one of three kind of major campaigns military attacks uh, it right there centered around the middle east and the names are borrowed from the locations um that we see in the bible so According to the Bible, after this Jerusalem campaign, the Antichrist will specifically set up his throne in God's temple. And so let's read what uh, the Apostle Paul talks about in the uh, books, in his letters to the Thessalonians. And um, this is what I was alluding to earlier. He, speaking of Antichrist, will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So that's 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Notice that this passage just uh, it predicts certain events in relation to certain details that currently and presently don't seem to be either possible or or allowable number one there's no antichrist that we're aware of yet although he could be living in today's age i mean we're very very close it appears to me uh, i sense uh, and as do other uh, prophecy students and teachers that we're very very close to these events taking place um, a lot of the key players are already in place uh israel being back in her land obviously um the temple mount being currently occupied by islamic and muslim uh, artifacts right the dome of the rock and the al al aqsa mosque i sometimes get that right I'm wrong i think it's al aska aska or aqsa i can't remember aqsa a k s a aska a s q a one of the two but there's two holy shrines up on the temple mount right now which seems to spell conflict for israel right there's there's a problem there but paul was shown by the spirit that there must be something up there that allows israel to resume animal sacrifices and allows for satan's puppet antichrist to go inside and to desecrate it says he sets himself up in god's temple but the the as tim Hague is uh, reminded in his own studies the language that that both paul uses as well as daniel when they're talking about this this time period um both in the hebrew and the greek uh, or aramaic it depends there could be just maybe either a smaller structure doesn't have to be like a full-blown temple could be a smaller portable type of 
um, altar where you can lay an animal up there and um, do do the sacrificial ritual and then move it uh, to a different location or something. It doesn't have to maybe be permanent. Or it could be just an area of the Temple Mount itself that is given over to this particular Jewish uh, practice. But either way, currently, no Jewish religious activities are allowed on top of the Temple Mount. There's these Muslim women that are kind of like um, lookouts for any Israelis who want to try and go up there, religious Jews, rabbis, whomever, want to go up there and maybe do some prayers, do, do their little afternoon prayers or start reading from their prayer book. There's these women that are dressed in black. You've heard the men in black? Well, Islam has their women in black that are kind of like, they're not really spies, but they're lookouts, as it were. They 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 kind of patrol the temple area and they watch for um, non-Muslims who might try to sneak up on the Temple Mountain and do what they're not supposed to be doing. But eventually, some form of agreement between the Antichrist and Israel and her neighbors, including the Muslim religious side of the house, they're going to have to reach some agreement where something allows for what we're reading about right here in Second Thessalonians to take place. Otherwise, Paul wasn't seeing things clearly. Let's keep reading Joel Richardson. The location of the Jewish temple, he says, has always been on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Today, the temple that once stood on Mount Moriah does not exist. It was destroyed, of course, by the Roman Emperor Titus in 70 AD, according to the prophecy of Jesus. So let's read the prophecy that Yeshua uh, left us. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Jesus says, do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth. Now listen to these words very carefully. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Matthew 12, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 1 and 2. And so I might add, uh, since uh, maybe Joel Richardson doesn't say it, all of the temple stones were overthrown in um, in uh, um, fulfillment of what Yeshua said. And yet, if you go today to Israel, you'll notice that there's the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, and there are lots of ancient stones there. In fact, there's a bunch of little pieces of paper stuffed in the cracks between the stones, which are the prayers that people have been, have been writing and stuffing in there uh, for centuries. And so you're probably asking, wait a minute, maybe Yeshua didn't get it right because all those stones are still there. I thought all the stones are supposed to be overturned, not one stone to be left. Ah, here's the answer to that seemingly contradictory dilemma. The Western Wall, as I understand it, ask archaeologists and ask Temple Mount Faithful, and they'll explain it to you. The Western Wall represents the supporting base, the foundational part of the Temple Mount itself. The supporting wall is not included in the temple structure proper. So when Yeshua was describing the destruction of the temple and its stones, he was describing the structure that was on top of that was resting on top of the supporting wall. He didn't have to describe the, the the foundational part of the structure. So that allows for us to realize that Yeshua's uh, prophecy came to pass with exacting detail, and yet at the same time, he it must, in hindsight, we realize that he must not have been talking about the supporting wall. It must not have been seen as a part of the temple proper that needed to be destroyed and its and its stones overturned uh, because the, the the Roman armies that were led by Titus, which were largely built up by not just Roman uh, uh, citizens, but conscripted uh, people groups from other nations as well, and many there in the Middle East, so that it was kind of a mixed uh, ra- ethnical uh, army, but and that'll come into importance later on, so that's why I mentioned it now, but those people, when they saw all of the gold and the precious jewels and and everything in the temple even though titus himself and you can read about this in josephus even though titus himself urged them do not do it don't do it don't destroy this beautiful look at the beauty of this temple we can take the jewish people and kick them out and we can take this place this can be our own our own um um temple we can turn it into our use look how beautiful it is i mean this the, the architecture and, and the and the craftsmanship i mean and look at all the gold and the precious um uh linen and the the, the artist you know all the tapestry and the um you know the, the the hanging curtains and and all of the the i mean there's a lot of 
workmanship that went into this. Don't do it. Don't destroy it. But the armies were just crazed by all the the, the, the frenzy of, of the, you know, caught up in kind of the mob mentality and the um, um, the fire uh, uh, reflecting off the gold Josephus describes. And they went and they just ter- overturned every stone, not in order necessarily to throw down the temple, but to look for more gold. Because as the fire burned, as, I'm, as Josephus described it, as the fire waxed hot, the gold melted down into the cracks of the stones. The gold that was overlaying all of the, the temple artifacts like the gold menorah and the, the table of showbread and many of the article, the furniture and stuff is overlaid with gold according to the Torah. So as the fire burned, that overlaid gold, which is thin sheet of gold, was melted off and liquid eye melted and turned into liquid and melted down into the cracks. And so that's why they overturned all the stones. It was not to destroy the temple, but it was to get at that gold that had seeped down into the cracks, right? That's the only way to get to it. Kind of like gold mining, the old, uh, you know, the, the easy way. So that's what she was describing. All of this temple to- the temple, the stones will be overturned. The Wailing Wall slash Western Wall is not part of the temple proper. There was no gold that seeped down to those cracks, so therefore none of those stones were overturned. That's why they're still there today, and why you can go to the Western Wall and pray. All right, Joel continues. That was a little kind of a tangent. Sorry about that. Blame it on my autism. Today, Mount Moriah, sometimes known as the Temple Mount or in Arabic as um, Haram Ash Sharif, is the location of two mosques. Here we'll get the names that I was butchering earlier, and is considered to be the third holiest site in Islam. We know that Mecca is one of their holiest sites, uh, and, and Medina is, I think, one of their holiest sites in Islam. There is endless, Joel says, endless speculation about the Temple Mount regarding issues such as exactly where the Jewish temple was once located on the mount or whether or not there will be a Jewish temple rebuilt there in the future. And boy, all you have to do is do like kind of a Google search for this topic, third temple in Jerusalem, or go to YouTube and do the same type of search feature. And there is a lot of internet chatter and a lot of buzz going on these days about the temple being rebuilt and the controversial um, aspects of how that can be played out, especially because of those two holy sites that are up there on the Temple Mount right now. And so it's not a secret that organizations in Israel right now are already prepping for a third temple. They're already they're just kind of waiting for the full-blown green light to go up on the Temple Mount and start constructing, right? But they're prefabricating kind of almost like in um, modular fashion, like modular houses work. You build them in the factory like puzzle pieces in, in, in you know, like a, a room here, a room there, a section here, a section there. And then you haul them in giant pieces over to the site where they're going to reside and you kind of snap them back together and then permanently um, fix the... Uh, uh, pieces all together into one structure. Uh, they're kind of doing that with the temple right now they're, so that it could go up very, very quickly. And they're also manufacturing all the priestly garments and furniture. The menorah itself is already uh, built and it's on full display in Israel. You can see it's like in this kind of this bulletproof uh, theft proof uh, glass structure. Maybe I'll put a flash a picture of it in post. So um, they're training Israelites, uh, Levites, um, how to do all the um, uh, rituals and things like that. And they're, easing, they're even raising red heifers for purification rites so that we can go through the um, necessary steps to purify those who are going to be working in the temple. They're getting everything ready, and yet there's still a lot of controversies. So Joel Richardson says, based on the above verses from the Apostle Paul, it certainly seems to indicate that there will indeed be a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And I agree. Um, that there, I, I, I take the uh, position that there will be a full-blown temple that perhaps maybe could get built prior to the 70th week itself kicking off. Right? Maybe even, like, let's say, let's just throw out some... Um, sample time frames let's suppose here in 2023 a temple starts construction and let's say it takes five years to build i don't know i'm just throwing out a number so let's say it's built in um in five years and then the antichrist says wow i see the progress that you guys have made israel with this modular temple it's already built but there's no peace agreement so let me go ahead and facilitate a peace agreement so you can take the this um lego set 
temple and move it over to its permanent home on Temple Mount. Now that I kind of work out the political uh, tension between you and your Muslim neighbors and get the temple put where it's at, where it needs to be. Otherwise, think about it, people. Israel has had almost 2,000 years to rebuild that temple that got destroyed in 70 AD. Why haven't they simply rebuilt one on a different site? Right? Somewhere else in Jerusalem or somewhere else in the world, somewhere else where it's safe. Why not build one here in America? I'm sure Americans would, would well, maybe not. Got to rethink that one. All right. I'm sure somewhere a temple could be rebuilt, right? Israel could find some piece of land, some piece of real estate where someone's going to allow them, where they've got complete sovereignty, where no one's going to complain if they build a temple and start sacrificing animals. All right. Something like that. Well, I think there will be a temple that rebuilt. Maybe it's built before the seventh week kicks off, or maybe the peace agreement takes place first, and then they start construction so that when the midpoint of the week comes, there is at least enough of the temple put together. Because if they follow the biblical pattern like they did in Exodus, starting in chapter 25 with the, with the building of the tabernacle, they'll start from the inside out. They'll start with the holiest of holies and work their way uh, outward in concentric circles of building all the other pieces and then put it all together. You don't start like like a modern building where you start on the outside, frame it, and then build, construct all the inside parts last. Uh, if you read through the account of the building of the tabernacle, it's, it's starting from the inside out. Start with the, the, the Holy of Holies, get that put together first, the ark and all that, and then build what's known as kind of like the tent of meeting, and then construct the uh, the courtyard around that, and then the 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 um uh, the, the palisade around that, and then uh, all the other structures uh, are built around it. So we start from the inside out. Well, perhaps Israel will do the same thing at the be at the beginning of the seventh week if one's not already built. They'll start with the smaller sacrificing edifice, the kind of a tent of meeting, portable structure first, and then start building up the temple around that tent of meeting. So they could they could be con conducting sacrifices while the temple is being built. That's the point I'm trying to make is is they don't have to build the whole temple and then wait for it to be built and then move in and do the sacrifices. They, it's very efficient. They could start doing them right away as soon as they get the green light from the Antichrist. So that's the point. Um, so the Apostle Paul uh, says that the Antichrist will, quote, unquote, set himself up in God's temple. Notice it's God's temple. And yet, it's a temple that will once again be desecrated by the Antichrist. Remember, the first one was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes uh, that we read about in Daniel and we can read about in history, right? Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple uh, 200 years before the first century. You can read about that in the book of Maccabees. You can read about it in Josephus, historical writings, etc., etc. So, the temple was defiled once. It will obviously be defiled again. And then, when Yeshua comes in to bring in his, his millennial kingdom, will it be this temple that he moves into? doesn't have to be. I believe myself that during all of the military campaigning and the fighting over Jerusalem and the intense... Uh, war that's going to be taking place. You know, half of the city is going to be destroyed, and the, there's going to be a giant crack right in 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 um, um, in the in the Mount Moriah or whatever, and things like that. Um, the Mount of Olives will split into et cetera, et cetera. So, all of the destruction to Jerusalem is going to take place uh, during the seventieth week. I believe the temple itself will be in shambles. It won't be really be usable. I think it'll just be trash rubble again the third temple that we're talking about it's one that's going to be get rebuilt for the 70th week temple that 70th week temple will be destroyed again and the Yeshua is just going to have to come in clean up all the mess and start his own construction again and build another temple for the millennial time period that's my perspective but the apostle paul talks about uh antichrist setting himself up in god's temple or more literally uh quote unquote he takes his seat in the temple of god so it is described as god's temple so then in one sense it's god's but in another sense it's god allowing israel to build a structure that there there's likely not going to be any holy spirit activity in the temple like there was in the past right the shekhinah that moved out of the temple like just described in the book of ezekiel where ezekiel described the spirit of god kind of sadly departing from the temple moving slowly from place to place from one place to from the innermost places like the holy of holies place outwards as if kind of sadly leaving god's temple because it had been defiled and polluted by man's sin and wickedness the holy spirit left 
the glory of God slowly left, and Ezekiel describes this. I can't remember which chapter, but I'll pass. I'll put it up in post production. And um, once the glory of God departed from the temple, and man didn't even know it, then what do we say of that temple? Ichabod, right? Ichavod in in Ichavod in Hebrew is there is no glory. Kavod is the, means glory, and E is the kind of the neg, neg, negating aspect. So, I, I, our word Ikabod means I kavod in Hebrew. The glory has departed from God's temple. There's no glory here. And um, so, it's a, really a sad uh, uh, narrative. But this 70th week temple will likely also be spiritless. I don't think God will fully endorse that particular temple. Uh, I could be wrong there, but I don't think it's until the millennial temple when the, the glory of God will actually return to the one that Messiah builds. So Joel continues by saying, this speaks not so much of a literal sitting down when it talks about the Antichrist taking a seat as it does of taking a... <clears throat> A position of authority when it says he'll take his seat in the temple could be a chair there could be that he plops his rump right up on the holy of holies you know uh, sits up on the ark of the covenant and takes some selfies yeah he can post on his instagram account for everybody to, to hashtag and follow you know hashtag sitting in the temple hashtag abomination of desolation you know hashtag uh holy of holies check it out something like that right um don't mean to sound irreverent but it's going to be a horrendous event for Israel because once that takes place they will realize that this man that they trusted at the first uh, of the week right three and a half years earlier this man that they put all their trust into and that the world also believed was a man of peace and brought peace and prosperity to the rest of the world this man is Satan incarnate he's evil incarnate he's going to seek to wipe us out he's gonna wipe out our religion and he's going to impose despotic world rulership world authority and get the entire world to try to follow after him right he's really gonna throw all of religion under the bus at some point in time right he's going to exalt himself above everything that is called god and every other religion he's going to say i am the ultimate religion i am god worship me satan finally get what he's been after for so long which is the worship of most of humanity um like uh, in your face worship right thus we see that the antichrist will make mount moriah and more specifically the rebuilt jewish temple he's going to make the specific location this the, the specific location of his rule so for a little while jerusalem will be his headquarters and in a, in a sense and we'll get to this uh, uh, in time for a brief while jerusalem will effectively be mystery babylon she will be the seat of Satan's authority in the world uh, from a religious perspective. How much politically and militarily, I don't know, because Jerusalem doesn't seem to be the most defensible uh, place in the world, although it's, it's fairly safe in some regards because of the iron dome defense and things like that but and with antichrist at the helm um he's going to be controlling what where the missiles fly and where the bullets go but at some point in time as i understand it um he's by exalting himself as god and by setting himself up as the um ultimate ruler he does utilize jerusalem as his headquarters just like antiochus set up jerusalem as a, a kind of a um staging post to launch military attacks or something like that um at least to strategize satan uh antichrist might do the same thing in the end he's going to use uh, um, uh hijack jerusalem you know overtake it and and occupy it and set himself up as a ruler there but probably i suspect because he is a man who worships uh the bible describes it in the old testament as a god of fortresses i think it's daniel's words if i remember um he he worships a god of fortresses which is a description of he's not really interested in religion or it may be even politics he's more interested in military might and so for him the thing that gives him his authority or his his strength his foundational base of power is his military might his his mil his, his armies and his his missiles and his his nuclear his nukes and things like that so i don't know if israel is going to be his military headquarters it might be his religious headquarters 
and it might be a staging ground but it seems more likely that wherever he is really stationed from like either in turkey or iraq or iran maybe or maybe even farther north like russia or something like that or maybe just a little north of israel like lebanon or the you know maybe as close as the golan heights or something i'm not sure um but that might be uh, somewhere where you can have maybe a large military um uh arsenal right jerusalem itself is just so kind of decrepit old and there's not a lot of place to to put a, 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 an immensely large amount of weaponry like massive amounts of tanks and jets and and nukes and 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 you know endless amounts of grenades and and uh, missile launchers and and rpgs and and i said rpgs yeah and and uh and and bullets and stuff but if you go to one of those other areas that i mentioned like where, the, where there's a lot more room where you can hide it from public view right where you can have like deserts and deserts of hidden bunkers of of munitions and things like that um that seems more plausible to me but so uh, we'll, we'll see how this pans out so jesus warned of this event 2000 years ago right referring to the antichrist joel richardson reminds us having set himself up in the jewish temple and the events that will immediately follow here's what our lord actually said let us read now from um some of the gospel accounts so when you see yeshua speaking to his disciples when you see in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation right yeshua is referring back to daniel's accounts of the antichrist defiling the temple but at the same time yeshua is also alluding to the pri prior historical account of antiochus defiling the temple so yeshua is describing a, a, another yet defilement that could either a be immediately right around the corner such as 70 a.d and or b be farther into the future in our day like even 2000 years away from when yeshua was talking so we talked about this prophetic telescoping a long time ago near far prophecies partial fulfillment total fulfillment when we're talking about abomination of desolation there's a little bit of that going on with uh the earlier events with antichrist i'm sorry with antiochus and then the farther events with antichrist right being type and shadow against one another so when you see this event happen spoken of through and then of course yeshua references daniel the prophet let the reader understand he even adds right the um the uh, kind of editorial note added by uh the writer to the gospels let the reader understand then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains notice the urgency of the matter right don't go back and get your iphone don't go back and um make sure that your um laundry is not still in the washer or whatever you know you don't need to worry about all those kind of superficial things um you israel you jerusalem right primarily these words are for jerusalem uh, uh israelites dwelling right there in jerusalem or in judea at that day you need to get up and go right those who are in judea which of which jerusalem uh, is there in judea you need to flee to the mountains um let no one go to the roof of his house or go down to take anything out right that's why i was jokingly saying the iphone don't let him go out and take anything else out of the house let no one in the field uh go back uh to get his cloak it'll, it'll be so urgent because the antichrist likely because of israel dwelling at peace like ezekiel 38 talked about and because of the fact that he's the one that brokered that false peace well then he will have access in and out of jerusalem unchecked no one's going to question him he's the savior of the world he's the he's the this darling of of earth that has made it possible for peace and prosperity in places where it wasn't thought possible not just middle east peace middle east peace i believe that he'll there will be a measure of global rest to some regards in some places not everywhere because there'll still be the um the other uh f three or four seals that are opened up in the from the time period of the first part of the seventh week to the midpoint of the seventh week right the 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 rider on the white horse and then we have the uh, the um the the red horse and then the the black horse and then the pale horse i think that's the order i always get that order wrong but it's those four horses of the apocalypse that's still going to be representing the 
kind of disturbances that are taking place in and around the earth you know the the, the famines and the, the 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 plagues here and there and the wars and rumors of wars and the the unrest and the um uh you know the 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 fam uh, um the, I'm sorry the sicknesses and things like that so there'll still be some of that going on everywhere in the world but antichrist will have a measured amount of success don't go back because he's already there in jerusalem he's he's right there so all he has to do is just turn his sights on israel it doesn't seem like he has to be very far away he'll be right there um when he just kind of turns on them how dreadful Joel's uh Yeshua says it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers right this will be really really bad time in fact the worst time ever described in any type of conflict or turmoil anywhere in the earth right which means this will make like um the inquisitions look very very pale it will make the holocaust look like a joke whatever antichrist has in store for israel and jerusalem will make those events i just mentioned as horrific as those were it will make those look insignificant right this you should just pray that your flight will not take place in winter right because that would be really hard to move in and out of places quickly if it's winter flights might be grounded at ben Gurion airport or you know tel aviv might be under um gridlock because of massive amounts of you know ice and snow built up on the roads or whatever whatever so it might be hard to get out plus it'll be cold you know um if you just maybe have to just flee without even getting your best winter jacket etc etc um play that pray that it won't take place in winter or on the sabbath right what happens in israel on the sabbath now lots of um uh, uh, lots of places shut down resources shut down you know roads some roads shut down so uh, it's not easy to get around so if antichrist decides that he's gonna attack on a sabbath day well then a lot of israel will not won't will be unsuspecting they won't they'll be in a place of rest and there won't be a lot of resources for people to access right certain buses will not be running or uh, trains or subways etc etc public transportation will be like it is now currently in israel in religious circles especially <clears throat> maybe not so much in tel aviv which is more secularized but the closer you get to jerusalem and you get more and more orthodox control over certain areas where religion plays a big part and you have uh, religious policies that are implemented well then uh, sabbath is where a lot of the city shuts down so yeshua is saying pray that your flight won't have to be when he says flight there it doesn't mean airline flight per se uh it could include that but it just simply means your escape plans pray that they won't be on the, in the winter or on the sabbath for then there will be great distress and here's these are yeshua's thoughts not mine this is why i made the comparison to the holocaust and the inquisitions and and the um other um hardships that israel has had to go through they will be unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again you have to let the magnitude of yeshua's words sink in take all of the worst events that have befallen not just humans but israel in specific and israel has been persecuted quite a bit i mean going all the way back to the pharaohs of old look at all the times that israel has had hardship you know from the pharaohs to the assyrian from the egyptians to the assyrians to the babylonians to the medes and persians to the greeks to the romans to the ottomans to the um uh, the not the nazis and then now to this current um uh what's going on in israel today and then will eventually play out in the eighth beast empire uh the new world order except this eighth beast empire led by the antichrist and his puppet his own puppet uh, the false prophet and that whole um cabinet of members and, and the ten nation coalition etc etc this will be an unparalleled time unequaled distress from the beginning of the world until now yeshua says even what happened in 70 a.d with the romans and destruction of the temple leading up to the jewish revolts in the 130s with bar kokhba and the eventual expulsion of israel from the land and the plowing under of jerusalem right even erasing the name of jerusalem from the map temporarily they renamed it alia capitolina right this time period will not the, the time period that Yeshua was talking about will be even worse than what took place in the first century. So, now if you're a preterist, you think that that's, that already happened, that there's nothing 
uh to look forward to in the in this upcoming future but i'm not a future i'm not a pair of a preterist i don't believe that yeshua's words were completely fulfilled partially fulfilled yeah there's some parallels to what took place in the first century first century to what's going to take place at during the 70th week i think there's parallels there but ultimately i think the final fulfillment the filling up of scripture will take place in the future thus i'm a futurist yeshua continues says if those days what days the days of persecution not necessarily the days in other words the days of tribulation not necessarily the days of the 70th week as a whole the 42 months 300 um, uh, 1260 days uh three and a half years that's uh, time times and half a times that's uh mentioned in the bible in several places i don't think that's the cutting short that's set that's fixed but the wrath of satan that's poured out against god's people or anyone who would resist him primarily directed towards jews and christians right isn't that interesting let me pause that satan and antichrist are directing their intense hatred against jews and christians and not primarily against other religions or people groups in the earth this shows that it's demonic right that anti-semitism and this type of hatred is specifically against god's chosen groups of people israel christians and uh those who name the name of christ which shows us ultimately that many of the other religions in the world are really unwittingly on the side of evil whether they know it or not by not embracing the love of the truth which is the the, the bible god's word the gospel his messiah etc etc the holy spirit by by not embracing that um truth and that worldview they line themselves up on satan and antichrist side of the chessboard without realizing that but that's what they're doing and so thus it makes sense that in this intense cosmic chess game between god and satan that's being played out on planet earth between antichrist and and other people groups that the antichrist is focusing <clears throat> most of his attention against jewish people and christians but not necessarily against say muslims and like, buddhists and hindus and and other religious people groups it's kind of interesting um side note but let's continue so joel uh Yushua says if those days had not been cut short the days of tribulation no uh no one or no flesh in other verses and other translations no one would survive but for the sake of the elect who's the elect it's the people i just described the jews and the christians that's the elect and if you're a jewish christian then you kind of overlap both of those um categories but read revelation chapter 12 again satan after he's thrown down to earth at the midpoint of the week after he makes war with michael and his angels in heaven and is defeated and gets thrown down to earth satan goes after the woman who's israel who fled into the desert by the wings of an eagle for 1260 days satan goes after her and to make war with her offspring the those who um uh, name the name of yeshua to again read revelation chapter 12. so yeshua says the days of uh, tribulation for the for the sake of these elect the jews and the christians those days will be short that doesn't mean that if you're not jewish or christian in those days that you won't have some protection i'm simply trying to highlight the idea that if there's not some identification with these people groups in this last day then you're going to probably find it very difficult to um res to to uh, resist satan's uh, uh activities in that last day god is supernaturally protecting israel in many ways and obviously his promises uh made through his son extend out to the body right there's only one head and then the body of course the body of messiah so that protection extends to us but in the to the degree that it's, that he's protecting israel in that in those days if you are aligning yourself with israel then that protection can extend to you as well or you're aligning yourself with christians then this would be true of any ethnic people group or um religion in the world that wants to be friendly towards israel and christianity all right we've got about 10 minutes left in our study let's keep reading joel richardson joel says commenting on what we just read out of the all of the discourse so here we see jesus referring to the antichrist's occupancy of the temple as quote unquote the abomination that causes desolation and quote the desolation is a reference to the chaos 
and severe persecution against the Jews and Christians. Notice he says the same thing that I just said. Jews and Christians that will immediately follow when the Antichrist's true identity is revealed. And so in one sense, I'll put this little graphic on the screen. We always talk about who is the Antichrist, right? Is it, you know, is it a resurrected Hitler? Is it Charles, King Charles? Is it going to be a resurrected JFK? Is it going to be, you know, President Trump or maybe um, Jared Trump? Or is it going to be, you know, is it going to be Barack Obama? Is like, we always pick some political figure, right? It's going to be one of the popes that either died or one that's currently living. Is it or let's look at the Islamic models? Is it going to be one of their prophets or or their famous imams that's brought back to life or is living now but isn't making his presence known? Is it going to be Muhammad brought back back to life, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Is it going to be going to be the Ottoman rulers? Uh, you know who is the Antichrist? Who is this guy? Well, from my understanding, and I think Joel agrees if I'm correct. I've read this somewhere else in his writings. From my understanding, the identity of Antichrist is going to be withheld from public knowledge for as long as possible as long as he can uh possibly do so in order to make his entrance more dramatic at the midpoint of the week where he as it were takes off his disguise as a man of peace and reveals himself to be the man of destruction the son of destruction the son of perdition like he truly is the son of satan right like the old uh, exorcist damien son, you know the damien the antichrist uh the exorcist damien was the son of satan or whatever right so the antichrist i don't believe his full identity will probably be disclosed to the public it'll probably be known behind closed doors in certain circles and closed circles in the elite kind of um uh, you know, sort of almost um, what we call kind of um, almost like um, Masonic circles, you know, where they got these hidden rituals and behind closed doors, secret handshakes, uh, that type of stuff going on. The Antichrist will probably be known in those circles where the upper echelons have a need to know. You know, yeah, they've got top, top, top secret clearance to have a need to know who the Antichrist is and what he's doing so they can properly groom him and help him uh, come to power and, and pull the strings they need to do. But the general public, the rest of the world, you know, CNN and Fox News and all these uh, outlets, I don't think they'll know who the Antichrist is until the midpoint of the week. And that's when media is going to go crazy saying, what? This guy's the Antichrist? We thought he was a good guy, you know? when it takes off his disguise and when the veil is lifted, when there's a, what I'm trying to describe is that there seems to be a spiritual component to Antichrist's hidden identity up to a point, right? Only after the midpoint of the beat, when not just him setting himself to, up in the temple, but there's this spiritual aspect where God allows the disguise to be revealed, right? Either the, what we're calling the restrainer uh, in the Old Testament, or Paul's writings as well. Um, this restrainer is removed. Uh, Paul talks about, is this the Holy Spirit? Is it Michael the Archangel? Is it the church? But this restrainer, there's a couple of different candidates for who this or what this restrainer is. But ultimately, it's God. Ultimately, it's God who's not allowing the identity of Antichrist to be revealed. But sooner or later, at the midpoint, God allows either by removing the church through the rapture or by removing the Holy Spirit from the earth, which is um, co co um, coordinates with, uh, which co coincides with the rapture, right? The church and is removed and then the Holy Spirit leaves and they both leave planet earth. Or I don't follow either one of those. Uh, I believe it's Michael, the archangel as described in Daniel chapter 12, who stands up and the standing up is the posture described of, um, of kind of uh, uh, relinquishing his position of protecting Israel because God says it's time to, to stand aside for a second. Anyway, let's keep uh, reading, Joel. We've got just about two two minutes left, and I'll be able to finish this paragraph. Joel's uh, commenting on Yeshua's words after the Antichrist's military campaign against Jerusalem. So we'll call this the Jerusalem campaign, midpoint of the week. After this time, the Antichrist will make his base of authority the Temple Mount itself. And I'm, I'm in complete agreement with that. And effectively, at this point in time, we could we could um, describe it, Jerusalem as the um, Babylonian harlot at that perspective. Although I subscribe to a um, a, a, um, a position 
I'm not set in stone on this. I could be turned if someone gives me some more information. But presently, my suspicion, and I'm going with the model that that Jerusalem and that Israel is not the ultimate mother of harlots, the um, the, the one that's described in Revelation 17. I think that title is probably uh, describing some other Muslim slash Arabic city or region like Medina or somewhere maybe like Qatar or or Qatar some people say or somewhere else in Saudi Arabia maybe somewhere along the coast there where there's this very um extravagant extrava extravagant city very rich portal city right on the coast uh, even medina itself is kind of uh, inland from the coast not right on the coast even jerusalem is not right on the coast but this description the city is a coastal city and there are plenty of um muslim arabic uh islamic cities that could fit this description very rich very important in um trade and commerce there in the middle east um even Qatar, if I remember, is uh, in, in one metric the richest city in the world. I, I don't know if it's like GDP or if it's per capita. I have to look at the numbers once again. But it certainly doesn't seem to match Jerusalem's description here. But at this point of the middle week of the week, in a kind of a religious sense, Jerusalem is that mother of harlots. She's the Babylonian harlot at that moment. At this moment. So Joel continues, and I'll uh, conclude with this. Joel, with this paragraph, Joel says, "At this time, it's clear that the Antichrist's malevolent feelings toward Israel will become fully manifest. So much so, he says that Jesus warns the inhabitants of Jerusalem to straight away flee to the mountains. And we might add, I might add, those are kind of like the, either the mountains of Israel or could be maybe that uh, uh, Jordan, which neighbors Israel right there on the uh, east side of the um, Jordan River. Um, could be that God gives favor uh, which is like like ancient day Edom. God gives some amount of favor between Israel and and uh, Jordan, the, the 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 country of Jordan, and allows Israelites to either to flee south into the Negev, like towards uh, Egypt, or to flee kind of south and east into um, Jordan and things like that. But I don't think they're going to be fleeing north so much, like towards the Golan Heights and and like towards Lebanon and things like that. They they might go west and flee towards like uh the west bank i'm sorry not the west bank uh towards um the um uh the, where's that place right over right on the very west coast of, of, of the coast of israel I'm drawing a blank it's it's not the west bank that's on the west bank of the jordan river it's the i'm drawing a complete blank but you guys i'll put a little uh, thing on the map um you guys can see it there it's it's palestinian controlled um and I'm just drawing a blank for what that area is. But I don't know. I don't think they're going to go there. But we'll see what happens in that day. Um, but uh, I hope that you're enjoying the study thus far. We'll continue to flesh some of these out as we go. Next week, we'll be poised to begin look at this particular topic. The Mahdi's attack of Jerusalem and the establishment of the Islamic Caliphate from Jerusalem. We'll look at this through the lens of the Islamic model. And remember, in closing, the Mahdi is a religious leader whose parallel in the Bible is in fact the Antichrist right go figure and that'll do it for eschatology a biblical study of end time events these are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, I'm a tour teacher to your congregation, K. Latunavada the Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at graftedin.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and um, took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tetze Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, uh, my YouTube channel there, be sure to uh, take notice that I update the uh, site 
but essentially daily, uploading videos daily. Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like. Um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on, and be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in a live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies. Um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q and A, but if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there, and uh, prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions. And I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of, of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to a, bit, a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's take these 30 minutes and unpack this verse. Uh, Psalm 110 verse 1, which reads, A Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, Sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Let's read the Hebrew and the Greek as well. Uh, I'll borrow this version right here. The, the, the Hebrew says, La David Mizmor, which means a Psalm of David. Try that. Uh, La David Mizmor, Neum Yahweh Ladoni. The Lord Yahweh says to my Adoni or Adonai, depending on which vowel point you follow. Shave limini ad ashit oivecha hadom le rag lecha. And that's the Hebrew version of what I just read there in the English. Let's pull up a Greek rendering for us from the Septuagint. And I've been borrowing, if you can see on the screen, there's two renderings of the Greek of the same um, passage. On the left side of your screen is the Alexandrinus transcript. And on the right is the Vaticanus transcript and you can see they're basically identical even if you can't read greek you can see that the greek letters are very similar between both verses the only difference that i can spot uh, right away with my eyes is the opening clause a psalm of david the one on the left reads to david salmas and the one on the right says salmas to david it just switches the subject and object in the greek but it, it, it means the same thing so let's read this verse as well to David Salmas, a Psalm of David, Apen ha kurios to kurio mu, the Lord uh, said to the Lord of me, Kathu ek dezion mu, heos an tho tus ek thrus su, hupa padion ton padon su. And we're working from this challenge presented to we Trinitarian believers, we Trinitarian Christians, this challenge of the idea that, let me turn back here for a second. Uh, let me see, do I have my... No, I don't have it. We're working from this challenge that Biblical Unitarian postulates that the, the second Lord in the passage is Yeshua, but he's simply a human Messiah. He's a man who was born in the first century, who lived his life in, a, in obedience to God his Father, supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a sinless life, and thus he went to the cross, he died, he poured out his blood, God resurrected him, raised him up, and exalted him at to sit at the right hand of God his Father, and thus he's the only human who rightfully has who has the right to be exalted to this place. He is to receive worship from all humanity because God deems it so. So, he is the Messiah in the view of the non-Trinitarian Christian domination known as Biblical Unitarian. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And to that degree, I have to uh, applaud Biblical Unitarian's messianic understanding of who Jesus is as their Lord and Savior. But stripping him of his divinity ultimately runs into a problem when it comes to the theology of who God is and his identity. And I've mentioned this early and early over and over again. Biblical Unitarian believes that there's only one single person of God rather than three persons of God. There's no 
Son and Holy Spirit in their understanding of the Trinity. They, they don't like the word Trinity. They don't even use it. God is a unity. And thus, as the single being, the single deity, the Son is, the, is a human. He's an exalted man, and therefore he can receive worship as, and I'm using air quotes with my fingers for those who can't see me, he can be exalted and he can be worshiped as God almost in a lesser sense, but not as the, in the ultimate sense. And he can receive divine worship uh, that's directed towards God because God has allowed it. God has deemed it. God has exalted him and given him the right to receive that worship without competing with his father's worship. The Holy Spirit in their model is simply another description for God or it's an impersonal force that's active in human in the lives of human beings as God deems it fit. But the important part that we need to consider is we have these very sometimes heated discussions about Trinitarian versus Unitarian topics is that some people who watch these videos want to argue the point that one of these two groups Trinitarians or Biblical Unitarians, one of these two groups is perhaps not true Christian because they've got an incorrect view of God. And sometimes it's both sides that are pointing fingers. Trinitarians down through history have sometimes excommunicated non-Trinitarians for their view of who God, who and what God represents in the Bible, how God's described. Is he Trinity? Is he unity? Is he one person? Is he three persons? Etc. And then on the other side of the fence, the non-Trinitarian groups sometimes accuse we Trinitarians of some form of heresy that uh, disqualifies us from wearing the label genuine believer or Christian as well. I was watching a few videos last week. One of them was actually my good friend Rabbi Eduardo. He recently had Dr. James White, who's a well-known biblical Trinitarian, Orthodox Trinitarian, uh, such as myself, on the show. And I'll put a little link in the description below so you can go back and watch the video for yourself. Um, Dr. White is a very famous apologist, debater, and Trinitarian believer. Right, he wrote the book, um, the forgot, the forgotten Trinity, or something like that, and he makes a note. And he and Rabbi Eduardo, at one point, have the question put put forth. I don't know if it's by someone in the chat at the time, or if it was a pre uh, fabricated question that they themselves agreed to construct. But the question was. Can a Christian believe in a non-Trinitarian God? Is it necessary to be a Trinitarian believer in order to be a true Christian? Or can you be a non-Trinitarian believer and and still have genuine relationship with God even though you don't believe he's Trinity? And it's a good question. And uh, I think that Dr. White gave an answer that I myself have always articulated uh, or always believed and supported. And so it was a very helpful answer that I'll share with you right now in very, very short summary form. And the, the answer is this. And when we're talking about salvation, ultimately, from our perspective as humans, we ultimately can't know about someone else. We can only speak for ourselves. So we cannot judge other people's salvation. We can only examine fruit. We can only um, come to some maybe very strong uh, consensus. We believe with our heart that someone is a believer if they exhibit all of the signs of a believer, if there's Holy Spirit, acti Spirit activity in their life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we seem to know their character and, and they have good judgment, etc. But ultimately, God is the author of salvation, so that's a good point that we have to bring up right away. But along with that, we also have to recognize that when we're talking about these topics such as Trinity and God's nature and what's revealed in the Bible, what was hidden in the Bible, what was progressively revealed, etc., etc., we have to realize that when we're talking about salvation, we're also talking about a topic that has a kind of a, um, a growth a uh, rate to it as well. You get saved with a limited amount of information about God and His Son, Jesus, and of the Bible itself. And then you grow, after you get saved and the Holy Spirit does move in, you grow in your understanding of those topics and of those issues. So no one truly just has it all figured out right up front and then moves into salvation. Usually it's, we grow in that experience. And so based on that, it's possible to be genuinely saved in a sort of limited information sense of the word where you don't have all the uh, information about what Trinity is and yet, or who God is, and yet you have a genuine experience that allows for the Holy Spirit to take up residency. You believe in your heart. Like Paul says, that God raised him from the dead. You confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. I know I switched that that order around uh, from the Romans uh, uh, the Romans road passage there, Romans 10 there. 
But the point being is that a genuine salvation experience does take place. And then from there, you grow in your understanding and knowledge of who God is and how he, uh, how he represents himself. And not just one, but three, yet one, right? The, the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of the Trinity. So James White brought that important distinction into the discussion as well, for the reason that while maybe as a whole we want to say that non-Trinitarians are unbelievers, we Trinitarians want to say that non-Trinitarians are unbelievers because they don't embrace Trinity, and Trinity is a, a vital component of of God's true nature and of salvation ultimately. But because we don't truly know the hearts of everyone, only God does, then we have to allow for that growth curve uh, possibility. And at the same time, Dr. White was careful to mention, it's one thing to be ignorant of facts, but it's another thing to be openly defiant of revealed truth. So here's the spectrum that we need to witness, that we need to be aware of. On the one hand of the pendulum swing, we have a person who comes to a genuine faith in Christ, but is ignorant of the details of Trinity. So they don't openly confess Trinity simply because they're in a state of ignorance. They don't know it's a genuine um, innocence on their part. They're not rejecting Trinity in, in a rebellious way. They're simply not confessing it openly with their mouth or articulating it because they haven't built that vocabulary up yet or that understanding has not been made apparent to them by the Holy Spirit and by careful study, years of study, etc., etc. The Trinity is a really difficult topic. Right? Let's be honest. But as that person grows in understanding of who God is, they are then confronted with more and more revealed truth from the Bible. The Holy Spirit shows them more and more light from certain passages here and there, particularly ones in the Apostolic Scriptures. And more and more truth is opened to their eyes until they become really a card-carrying Trinitarian, as it were. And at that point in time, they have a choice. They could reject that truth. And if they reject that truth, then that rejection of truth in open rebellion against Trinitarian doctrine and truth could actually be an, indicator, an indication that they're not truly saved. You know what I'm saying? It could be an indication that there's really no Holy Spirit a residency inside of them. It's that the mind and the will of that person is really rejecting God's true presence and they're saying, at one point in time, I profess to be a Christian, at least a believer, but now I can't accept Trinity. And they go after the counsel of people like Anthony Buzzard or um, uh, the gentleman that I'm going to flash on the screen uh, that I can't remember his name, the one who runs the outfit at Biblical Unitarian. I'm just drawing a blank on his name at the moment. I don't even know how to pronounce his name, obviously, as well. But, you know, the, we've got the Anthony Buzzards, Buzzards of the world, who's a very kind of a visible, high-vis high spokesman for anti-Trinitarian uh, Christian beliefs beliefs. We've got Bart Ehrman, the Bart Ehrmans of the world who are representative of kind of this atheistic uh, former Christians, but now atheistic, uh, skeptical, uh, modern skepticism that's you know, very kind of vogue in, in Christian circles. Those people who are kind of deconstructing their Christianity, as it were. Uh, you know, this, this, this term that's kind of uh, uh, popular these days, deconstructing my Christianity. So that's the distinction that Dr. White brings up. Go back and watch the video. You can either be ignorant of truth, but still be a Christian. So you may not profess Trinitarian doctrine, but it's because you're ignorant of it. You don't know how to articulate it, or you're just a little confused. But it's, that's a difference. That's far different from being openly rebellious and rejecting of truth that is revealed to you, and you ha you you can see that it's that it's Trinitarian, but you simply reject it openly and willingly after you've been shown that truth. That's the dangerous place that that Dr. White says. If you, as a person, subscribe to that theology, then you're probably demonstrating that you are not truly a Christian. And those people who openly embrace that theology, the kind that, say, Dr. Buzzard or Bart Ehrman or this other gentleman, uh, uh, John Shaneite, I think this is his name, the, the, I was forgetting his name earlier, John Shaneit or Shaneite, I'll flash his picture on the screen, um, that the theology that Biblical Unitarian is openly professing is an is a non-christian theology in in the sense that it's anti-trinitarian it doesn't embrace the true jesus and it's a dangerous theology on in that regard but can you be christian and be a biblical unitarian absolutely absolutely but maybe it's because you're in ignorance maybe it's because of the masses just like most christians they, they, they can't articulate trinity so that was an incredibly long 
what some might consider an opening, but I think it was necessary and it was a long time coming. I've said this in the past, so it's not really anything new, but it's been a while since I've articulated that to my audience in this particular venue. So having said that, we've got about 15 minutes left. I apologize that that just took up all of the really the first half of this 30 minute segment. Let's turn fully into um, a Trinitarian response to Biblical Unitarian after having given that long kind of 15 minute intro. Let's begin to look at some of the uh, apostolic scriptures passages. We've already gone on a lot of the technicalities where Biblical Unitarian purports that because of the two differences in the Hebrew and Lord in this passage, that the psalmist David was certain that the person he was seeing sitting at the right hand of God, Yahweh, was a human ancestor of his. The Lord says to my Lord. And yet, logically, we, we could see that that could be possible because remember, we Trinitarians embrace Jesus as fully human as well. So we don't have a problem with describing a, a fully, truly human Messiah. We embrace that. The challenge that we present to non-Trinitarians is that we say, yes, he's truly human. Yes, he's fully human, but he's also truly divine and fully divine at the same time. It's a mystery. How could Jesus be fully, truly, tru fully, truly human and fully, truly divine? Yes, I know it's a mystery. This is a paradox. So, was David describing a human Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father? Possibly, given the mystery of the incarnation that was in existence in David's day, right? The mystery being hidden, the incarnation wasn't fully revealed because God himself hadn't fully revealed it. So, yeah, it's possible David could have seen a... a human Lord sitting at the right hand of Yahweh Lord, but because of the absence of the little dots and dashes, let me flash those on the screen for you, because of the absence of all these little dots and dashes called, um, I think it's Nikudot, uh, I'm probably not saying, I, can all, I can't ever remember the names of all the little guys, um, they all have their own names, uh, the Kamats on the right side of the screen is kind of the, looks like a capital T, and it, it has a, an ah sound to it underneath a, a consonant, and on the left side of the screen, there's the Chirik, which is the little period looking dot that's underneath the consonant letter N, that gives a long I sound, the E sounding, so on the right side of the screen is Adonai, the name for God, the Father, Yahweh, and it's exclusively reserved for God. And on the left side of the screen is Adoni, and this is a name that normally and usually refers to some form of human superior, but it does show up in God's names and titles, contrary to what Biblical Unitarian likes wants us to think. So, if the point I'm trying to make now is simply if you take those little dots and dashes away from the script, like did exist in David's day, like did exist in Jesus' day and Paul's day, and all of the first and second and third and even fourth century Jewish uh, Christians and believers and Gentile Christians, it wasn't until I think after the fourth century that the Masoretic family added all these little dots and dashes uh, into the text. And when they did, they simply took what could have been Adonai and, turn, and um, uh, confirmed it as Adoni. So, according to Biblical Unitarian, it definitely is Adoni sitting at the right hand of Adonai, or sitting at the right hand of Yahweh. So, who was David looking at? All right, so when we turn to the New Testament, and I'm, I'm going to kind of start accelerating the study because it's been going on for a little while. I feel, I myself personally feel that it could be dragging on, and I might be able to finish tonight, So, uh, I, but I don't think I will. I, but at least I think I'll get through all the New Testament parts, and then I'll be able to turn to some final commentaries from some Christians. So, let's, let's look at this real quick. Um... In Matthew 22, we kind of uh, looked at this last week just briefly, starting in verse, let me back up a little bit, starting verse 41, right there. Um, this is reading from the NESB. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. Verse 42, what do you think about the Christ, i.e. Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. Verse 43, he said to them, Yeshua's answer, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? And then Yeshua gives us our quote from the Septuagint rendering of 
the Psalm 110. Verse 44, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then in verse 45, Yeshua continues, therefore, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to offer him a word in answer, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him any more questions. So Yeshua silenced his detractors. He silenced the religious leaders of his day with this quiz, which if we're to follow the biblical, the logic of biblical Unitarian should not be a quiz, should not be a paradox. According to Biblical Unitarian, it's a, it's an open and shut case. David was referring to a human Lord, and therefore, um, it, it is the son of David, and yet it's a super, he's a superior to David, but he's just a human. And yet, Biblical Unitarian can't really answer the question of, was David seeing this human in the prophetic future with his future looking eyes right in the spirit looking at a future event that hadn't taken place yet or was david giving an in looking actually into almost like the prophetic present where um since time since god is timeless and the holy spirit is timeless he was looking at uh events that were almost like happening in real time um, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, play on either side. I know some of you are saying, well, um, G Jesus wasn't sitting at the right hand of the Father w in the day of David. Well, yes and no. The Word made flesh was dwelling with God from eternity past, according to John 1.1. 1, 1. Right, John 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, etc. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where was the Word with God? Well, he was at the Father's side. He was with God. The Greek talks about proslambano. He was right next to God, um, dwelling next to God. So, in close proximity. He was with God. Even the Greek suggests of John that um, he was face-to-face -face with God, meaning he was very, very close. He wasn't like distant, like a wandering around throne where God's here and the, 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 the second person of the Trinity, the Word, is kind of wandering around the throne doing his own thing. No, John's description in, John, in the first three verses of John's prologue there gives a description of this eternal Word dwelling right next to God, face to face next to God. And so it's not entirely um, un- inappropriate to say that the word was sitting next to God, maybe at the right hand of God. And yet, in a, in a prophetic sense, Yeshua as the incarnate Son of God, the Son of Man, right, the human being, he had to live his life on earth, die as a, as a sinner, even though he didn't sin, but he died as a sinner on the cross, be buried, then be resurrected, and then be raised up and exalted at, and to sit at the right hand of God waiting until the Father puts the enemies of the Son underneath the feet of the Son. So, there is a little bit of future aspect to what David would have been saying about this Lord sitting at the right hand of his Lord, of God. And at the same time, according to John, the Word has always been dwelling next to God. At the right hand, meaning being like a, a position of authority, of governance, almost a kind of, um, almost like a... Um, uh, what we would say, a delegated authority on the behalf of the one who's sitting on the throne, the one sitting at the right hand is the, the delegated uh, co-ruler, the throne that's, that's next to the throne. That that concept even carries over to the point where David the king, once he takes the, the seat on the throne, God says, I will take my place to your right hand as a form of protection. Right? You can read about that in case you're wondering. Uh, when we get down to verse 5 of Psalm 110, the Lord is at your right hand. Right? But wait a minute. But the Messiah is at the right hand of God. So if God is at the right hand of David, whose throne is highest? Is it... Are we looking at this picture of David sitting on the highest throne? And then to the right hand of David is God the Father, and then to the right hand of God the Father is the Messiah? No, that's not quite what's going on. So this phrase, right hand, um, is just a kind of an idiom to describe um, protection in the context or 
authority that's delegated from the one who's actually ruling from the center throne at that particular moment. So to give them the context, if it's God the Father who's in the center position, then the delegated authority is the right hand, the person sitting at the right hand is ruling on behalf and co-ruling with the one who's sitting in the center throne, which is God the Father, the Yahweh figure, and thus that second Lord, the Adonai or Adonai, depending on which denomination you belong to, that Adonai or Adonai is at the right hand of God the Father, co-ruling with God, just like Daniel described, where the Ancient of Days gives uh, uh, the kingdom to the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, and just like John the Revelator saw the Lamb sitting next to or on the throne with God the Father, and thus the 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 uh, um worship divine worship the heavenly hosts are worshiping the 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 um God the Father and the Lamb. So we see that that um kind of partnership rulership together, but it's not it's not a competition, but in the hierarchy of God's um authority in heaven the father delegates this authority to the son right gives him that throne and so in verse one the center throne is god yahweh and the right hand throne the throne at the right hand of yahweh is the spot for the lord messiah either adonai or adonai depending on which position you take but in verse five the center throne is david and the person at the right hand of David, just like it says, the Lord is at your right hand. And just so you guys are sure that you're seeing this, look at verse 5 where it says the Lord that I highlighted on your screen. And when we go and look over at the Hebrew, it doesn't say Adoni. It says Adonai, right there. Adonai al yamin ka. The Lord God Adonai is at the right hand of you, David, because it's still addressing David. The Lord is at your right hand. Why? He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Who's the he? Could be God, could be David, could be God working through David, could be God doing it by himself. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men all over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So, um, uh, this verse, this psalm is very significant. I really should have read just the whole psalm. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Still addressing the king figure, either David or the Lord Jesus, depending on which, how, which near, far, prophetic, telescoping king of Israel that you want to apply here. The Lord, meaning Yahweh, because it's all caps L-O-R-D, will stretch forth your strong scepter. Whose scepter? Well, David in the lesser sense, but Yeshua in the fullest sense from Zion, because both ruled from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people, the king's people, whoever it is, either it's King David or King Messiah, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy art array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew, speaking of the subjects of this king. But then notice verse 4, the Lord, all caps, meaning it's Yahweh, God the Father, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you, whoever this king figure is, you are a priest. Well, this is weird. A priest king? You are a priest according to the order of Mel uh, Melchizedek. Was David a priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Not really, although his sons wore the we know they wore the 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 um the tunic um uh, at one point in time. His sons, I'll pull up that verse and pull it, show it to you in post. But the point being is now verse four is highly prophetic. Yes, it could apply to maybe David in a very very limited sense because his sons were called priests, and yet David himself was a king and he was not a Levite, and yet how could his sons play the role of priest if that was the if that wasn't the case? So there must be some maybe a little bit of prophetic uh, near far near aspect kind of type going on. I'm oh, sorry, shadow aspect going on. But ultimately, we realize that this prophecy of verse four is speaking of Yeshua because the book of Hebrews, when we start getting to chapter 4 and 5 and, and 6 and 7, uh, directly uh, addresses and um, um, uh, tributes this aspect of being a priest according to the order of Mel Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, as I always say in Hebrew, uh, whose name means king of righteousness, Malki, king of Tzedek, righteousness. This kingly figure is ultimately King Jesus, King Messiah. And so it's with that same context that verse 5 says, the Lord is at your right hand. 
meaning the Lord Adonai, according to the Masoretes, Val pointing, is at your right hand. And again, the majority understanding is that since this is Adonai, that this is God the Father, who says, I will be at your right hand to protect you. Not as a subordinate, like when Yahweh is in the center throne, but as your protection. And we know this because the verse, the context says, He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. That's the protecting language. The he there is talking about God's power, but it's the earthly king or the messianic king who is in the position of the throne at the moment, the center throne, God taking the position of the protection on the right hand. Just like the king holds the scepter as a symbol of authority, but the king also holds a sword when he goes to battle and he holds it in his right hand, holding the shield in his left hand. That's kind of the, the ancient way of portraying uh, warriors going to battle. They're right-handed with their sword, and left handed with the shield. So the right hand is also the sword, the hand that um, slays the enemy. So the Lord being at your right hand is a representation of that protection. And then it goes on to talk about he's the one that will judge among nations. Um, he'll drink uh, from the book by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head. Um, so the, the language is just very, very interesting. So using all of that, and I'm using up most of my time here, I can see I'm not going to get very far into this Matthew passage. Um, Yeshua, if this was such an open and shut case like Biblical Unitarian wants us to believe, and we're almost done here, if it was so easy to understand that this Lord sitting at the right hand of Yahweh the Father is this exalted uh, human, i.e. Jesus himself, according to Biblical Unitarian's model, remember, I'm not disagreeing that it's Jesus. Biblical Unitarian says it's Jesus. Psalm 110 is speaking of Jesus. Right down to the, the uh, Melchizedekian passage in verse 4, right down to the one sitting at the right hand, and all, this, all of that. I agree with him that it is Jesus. I'm not disagreeing on that aspect. What I disagree is that he's exalted, that, it, that he's divine. What I disagree is that they say that he's not divine. I, of course, say he is divine. But if it's such an easy case, then why would it put the leaders to silence here? No one was able to offer him a word. Why did it strike them as par uh, parabolic, as something that they couldn't understand, like a, a, a riddle? Because obviously what Yeshua is doing is, and he's done this in the past, he takes passages, and I'm closing with this, he takes passages out of the Tanakh that he knows speak to him. They speak of his identity. And what he has done over and over again is he will take those passages which were written in the time when his father had not revealed the mystery of the Trinity to human beings yet. And Yeshua will take those passages realizing that he, realizing that he is the embodiment of the mystery being revealed. He is the incarnate God being made manifest among humans. He is the um, transcendent God becoming um, imminent among humans, right? Transcendent is a description of God as a far away, unknowable, as it were, kind of far off, away from us, perspective-wise. And then the opposite side of the spectrum is the, um, uh, uh, what did I say, transcendent versus um, imminent. Imminency refers to that which is close to us. We can see Yeshua. We can talk with him we can uh, reach out and shake his hand and we can watch him get tired and hungry and and eat and sleep and do all the other normal things that humans do because he's fully human so you sure realizing this tension that is caused by the transcendent god becoming eminent the the uh, invisible god becoming visible you sure would take an opportunity every now and then to take those old testament passages that the Jews were familiar with and had many times memorized, that were describing a Messiah figure, a Lord, like in Psalm 110, and realizing that on the one hand, the Old Testament is describing a human being, a human Messiah. But on the other hand, these qualities that this Messiah would possess would ultimately reveal him to be the, the um, eternal God walking among us. So he's divine. And yet, that perspective is mystery in the Old Testament. So Yeshua's job is to unpack that mystery and to challenge people and to stretch their understanding of the God that they claim to worship. So in closing, these rulers are in a pickle because they now are faced with the same thing that I described in my imaginary Christian earlier. The truth is in front of them. They are confronted with the truth. 
This Messiah, this is their thoughts, and I'm closing with this. This Messiah that we read about in Psalm 110, that we thought was fully human, that David saw into the future, that he looked at in the future by the Spirit, that that was sitting at the right hand of God, is an exalted, important figure because he's sitting at God's right hand. I mean, it doesn't get more important than that. We will worship him, but wait a minute. This guy standing in front of us, this 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 son of Mary, this this bastard son of Mary, this this good for nothing from Nazareth, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? This uh, this this guy, um, he's claiming to be that person, right? That son of David, that descendant of David the king, and yet. Other times he claims to be the I am. The other times he claims to be equal with the Father. Other times he says, my Father's working, so am I. Other times he says, before Abraham was, I am. What is this guy trying to say, right? So they were faced with the truth. And so in the same way that once a Christian who's a non-Trinitarian is faced with the truth of Trinity, a divine Messiah, what does he do with that truth? Does he reject it in open rebellion? Does he raise his fist towards heaven and say, Bayad Rama, right, which is the Hebrew for uh, the, the, the high raised hand, the, the, the rebellious hand, and says no to God, and no to God's revelation of Trinity and God's Messiah? Or does he embrace it and say, Lord, I don't understand how you can send your human son into the world, who is a, sent, a descendant of David, and yet he's one with you. He's divine. He's that word made flesh that was manifest among us. He's that human Lord who's the son of man in the book of Daniel, and yet he's the son of God, meaning he's divine, like, like, like Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He is my Adonai. He's my Adonai, but he's my Adonai. He's my God. I don't understand how this can be. How can I see God? How am I still alive? So these rulers were faced with that same truth that Yeshua was revealing to them. And he put it to them in the form of a kind of a parable, of a of a of a of a pickle, of a of a of a of a, of a, of a um not a twister, a, a a kind of a puzzle. You know, explain this to me. Right, like 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 Ricky Ricardo would say to to Lucy, explain it to me. Right, tell me how this can be. How is it that Messiah is David's son, and yet he's uh, he's the Lord of David? Right. So Yeshua was playing with that idea. He knew his who he was. He knew who he was. He knew he was son of David, but he knew he was more than David's son. He was David's Lord, and in that sense, I believe we get our. First support. We'll look at the other passages next week. We begin to be peel back the support for the idea that the Masoretes didn't really give us the best representation when they said Adonai said to Adoni or Yahweh said to Adoni. I think I, I I need to find places that confirm this, but I suspect that really it was the context was Adon Yahweh said to Adonai. I really do. In other words, David was seeing this exalted Messiah, and he, even though he couldn't understand it fully because it was veiled in mystery, the Holy Spirit was giving him that idea that, hey, I'm just going to write what the Holy Spirit is impressing on my heart. Yahweh said to Adonai, not Yahweh said to Adoni. I really believe that's what David was saying. But even if I'm wrong, even if David wrote Yahweh said to Adoni and stripped this Lord of his divinity, it doesn't change the fact that Yeshua knows that he's Adonai. Yeshua is not confused. I really will close with this. I will shut up and, and let you guys go back and rewatch the video and, 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 and uh, play it back at half speed so you can understand what I'm saying. Yeshua had no misunderstanding about, about his divinity. Absolutely not. He knew that he was Adonai in the flesh. He knew he was Almighty God walking among men. Absolutely, he knew that. And so, if David didn't know it, Yeshua did. So, we can go with that as our final authority on the matter of what Psalm 110 truly is saying by letting um, the New Testament inform us of the Old Testament in this matter. So that's that's the theology that I'm working from. In case you're wondering, what's my hermeneutic? I'm letting the New Testament authoritatively explain the Old Testament to me, and I believe that's the correct way to read your Bible. And this is the weakness of biblical Unitarianism. 
They do not let the New Testament authoritatively speak to the Old Testament. They do it backwards like rabbinic Jews. They let the Old Testament drive all of their authority. And they stop there. And rabbinic Jews do not embrace the New Testament as the authoritative complete word of God. They reject the authority and the additional revelation. So they reject sola scriptura and tota scriptura. They reject both of those. Biblical Unitarian, by rejecting Trinity, is falling into the same pit and confusion and blindness as rabbinic Judaism. They're rejecting the authority of the New Testament and they're rejecting the final uh, revelation that the New, T- Rep- New Testament represents in the scope of God's progressive revelation of truth to mankind. So we'll stop there. We'll pick this up next week and let me see if I can push towards finishing this. We'll start right in Mark's rendering of the same passage uh, that we just read and um, most of it's identical. There's some minor differences here and there and then we'll move to, as you can see on my screen, we'll move to Luke's rendering of the same uh, passage where Yeshua is challenging the leaders about this particular passage. After that, we'll jump into the book of Acts where Peter at the day of Pentecost is describing Jesus and he eventually uh, talks about David talking about this Messiah when we get farther down into the passage. And then I've got some other um, commentaries lined up that may be handled next week but may take one more week. So there's either one week left or two weeks left, but I don't think it should be longer than that. But how did the scribes alter? Psalm 110. Did they knowingly change the text in places? Yes, they did. I'll just tell you right up front. Yes, they did. They changed it in places where it was uncomfortable with them to see more than one Yahweh or more than one Adonai. And Psalm 10 kind of fits into that uh, description. Uh, Even if it wasn't Psalm 10 that they altered, they certainly did it in other places. So there's precedent for us to say that they did alter the text. It's it's, it's openly known. It's known material. It's known information. Um, Right? So you can look that up for yourself. We'll eventually perhaps get to um, David Guzik's, Pastor David Guzik's. He's a Trinitarian Christian pastor. He has a commentary on Psalm 110. Messiah, priest, conquering king. Great resource there. There's another article here by Dr. Brown that's available in his um, Answering Jewish Objections to uh, uh, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus series, five-volume set. Uh, great uh, commentary set. Psalm 110 does not say Messiah is Lord, according to the voice of rabbinic Judaism. And then he decides to tackle that head-on. Uh, Tim Haig has his own commentary on uh, the part of of um, the God's name, uh, Yahweh and Adonai and Lord and things like that, uh, that I've uh, put together here. I've just uh, um, copied a piece out of that commentary. Tim Haig, The Sacred Name, A Study in Three Parts. It's available uh, for purchase or download, I think, for free at his website. And we'll look at some of those notes in time, possibly. As well as Tim Haig's commentary in the book of Matthew. We might pull that in time if we if we have it. We might not need to. And then lastly, I found just some um, general uh, discussion boards. Uh, get some like non-heavy-hitting theological, uh, say, um, doctrinal type of uh, um, chatter on Psalm 110, the significance of Adoni and variants uh, that you know normal people discuss, like non heavy hitting theological people like Dr. Brown and Tim Haig and Dr. Dr. White and and pastors and theologians. Let's look at what just normal people say. And this so this is kind of a discussion board that I've got pulled up from um discussthetruth.com. And then lastly, um uh, Peter uh, Lee, professor, Associate Professor of Old Testament Reformed Theological Seminary, Washington, D.C. He has a, a chapter, uh, an article in Psalm 110 Reconsidered that's worth looking at eventually in time. And then lastly, a blog from thehumanjesus.org. Adonai or Adoni? We do know. So we'll get to those in time. But that'll do it now for the Trinitarian Response to Biblical Unitarianism. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name. I call you Adonai, I call you Abba, I call you Father, I call you Lord. I call you Master and King. And in this way, I'm recognizing your authority, Lord. That You are the one who is the rightful ruler, creator. You are the Savior of all mankind. Now, in in, a purposely ambiguous manner, those who just listen to my opening prayer don't know if I'm addressing the Father or the Son. And so if you ask me, who are you addressing? I say, yes. Yes, there is this nuanced ambiguity or, or uh, uh, you know, purposeful uh, 
this, you know, mystery behind who am I, who do we address as Christians? Who do we call Lord? Well, this is reflected, I believe, Lord, in your word, when by the time of the Apostolic Scriptures, the Greek Bible had already given us the permission to call Yahweh Kurios and to call Messiah Kurios as well. And then by the time of the, really, of the Apostolic Scriptures, uh, God the Father was most often addressed as Theos, and Yeshua took the title Lord, which was already, in other words, kudios, which was already given to you, uh, God our Father. So, um, thank you, Father, for these truths that are very challenging at times um, to articulate. And so, in our ignorance, we can still have a genuine trust in you, but we know that the Holy Spirit will grow us up if we allow Him to. Uh, sharpen our understanding of who you are. I also thank you, Lord, for the tri for the um, eschatology study that I, that I conducted earlier. What a fascinating study, and one that will continue to be relevant for us as we move closer and closer to the events that we read about in our prophetic scriptures, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Help us, Lord, to have our our faith, put our faith and trust in you, and so that we will be able to withstand when this evil day comes, which is unparalleled according to Yeshua's own words. So. Thank you for um, the students who have joined me. Uh, raise them up, protect them, provide for them, and continue to bless us, Lord, so that we can be a blessing to those around us. And we'll be careful to give the praise and the glory. Bless Shem Yeshua. Amen.